Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am QMX, as he said, as she said, no one knows me by Douglas. I work at DigitalOcean, and yeah, thanks for them to actually bring me here. I have a very important disclaimer to make at this very beginning. So this talk tell, tells a story about how things went badly, badly wrong. And sometimes when you have to explain the reasons why you came there, you have to use examples. And this disclaimer essentially begs you a favor. Please be nice. And why am I, I'm, why I'm asking this question and asking you to be nice is that, you know, this is a very cute animal. I mean, I really love the gopher. And I have to talk about Golang problems uh, because that's what like motivated us on trying to look for rust. But I really like Golang. I mean, don't take it personally. It could be any other language. That's just example du jour. So let's get moving. Please leave the gopher alone. This is story time. I was working at my company and I joined a team for tackling a very interesting tech problem. Uh, we needed to process a bunch of data and do essentially some string processing. Uh, it had like high performance requirements. It was a distributed system and we're going to build microservices and you can imagine like this is like the uh, buzzword bingo. I was going to use other words with B but whatever. Uh, so essentially this is like a classic problem when people say yes, yes, this is perfect. Everyone so, kind of handles the same stuff and this is Unix with no this. No, actually this is Golang with no this. Like that's the standard answer to that question in general. And we fast forward a few months there and the project actually was a success. I mean, we did a microservice using Golang and all the technology that is there, all the tools and everything was happy. It was running in production. It was happily ingesting over 4K, very complex messages over a Kafka bus. And that was it. Like the project was running, everything was happy. And are we done? The reality is that software is never ever done. I mean, when you release it, then, the party starts, right? <laughs> and then is when you find out that not everything is roses. So we were running, we we're in production, customers were using this software indirectly, and my process crashed. And I had no idea why. Then that's kind of like where you start learning more about the language that you are working with. And I started looking at Golang with different eyes. Essentially, I have two structs there, like nothing special about them. They're kind of like the same as the C, the same as Rust, with a huge difference. I didn't know at the time that the default value for structs and for things inside structs was new. And it, it's, it manifests itself in subtle ways because when I kind of try to call a method on a pointer to a structure, this pointer can be nil and the compiler is not going to complain. And of course I did a big mistake. I had a new reference there. And then when I call this is actually prints wave on a new reference. If you are not accessing anything inside the structure, this is fine. But as soon as you have data there, boom, you are going to have a crash and a sec fault. And it's a terrible to debug until you, you grow older and kind of you learn more about the language and then okay, fine, I'm not going to do this mistake again. But it will be really nice if the compiler would bug me that this was like a new reference, like don't do that, please. Okay, this was a real problem. This caused it an outage and it was my fault, but whatever, it was annoying. But there are some things that are more subtle and I would say annoying, but not like life and death, but it's still annoying. So when we were trying to process a lot of network metrics and things going from a fire holes of events, like we're a cloud, cloud provider after all, there's a bunch of machines there. And suddenly you have to deal with a lot of counters. And those counters, usually when it's positive, you're going to go for an unsigned integer 64. That's fine, but what is the difference from the first to the second? One might mean megabits and other might mean megabytes. And this sounds like a very naive mistake, right? 
If you get the units wrong, everything is going to be wrong. And the only way that we found out that we were getting things wrong was because some customer uh, was looking at the charts and like, wait a minute, uh, it's impossible for me to have all this bandwidth. It's kind of like, yeah, we were doing things wrong. But this was like on the very early days on the beta access, oh, happily, and we got the bug before it went to general access. But there's another fun one. As we have a lot of networking gear, we have a lot of CPUs. And when you start doing processing on CPU metrics, sometimes you have to do like the linear interpolation for getting the points, and suddenly you have a bunch of slopes on a bunch of counters that it's a pain because you probably need to do some functional programming style, folding over several values, and oh boy, that's Rust functional support will be so nice, so much better than my function that was returning a function that was applying a slope, and yeah, it was not cool. So I have a very, one thing, there's only one thing that I really disagree with Go, that's kind of like, and I'm not going to talk about it because it's generics. I think it's, it's a given, they're wrong. Okay, no, I love them still. But let's talk about Rust, which, which is why we are here, right? So, it's, there are several ways of you introducing a tech to your company. And my approach was to try and make sure that this, we, we did things on as grassroots as possible. I'm kind of like not trying to make a big boom, not trying to force this choice over anyone. After all, we're a Golang shop. People love Go there. That's fine. So the first thing I did was to create a highlight for Rust in Slack. And then another one that was kind of like a little bit more evil, which is kind of like all the problems that I know on Golang and on Ruby, we, we have a lot of Ruby. And I kind of like, I had a very special set of highlights. So when people talk about those problems, I'm aware of them. And then I'm not going to go like Rust Evangelism Strike Force, please, no. Like, I'm not going to ask people to rewrite things in Rust. Please, no. I'm going to just be aware. Because my end goal is that we get better software and we know this, those shortcomings can be addressed in a better way. So we start with a side project, a very small side project, kind of like a toy project. But the main difference here is that I try to make it production ready. Like, what would I do if I had to ship this to production? So it's not only like it compiles, it works. We know that this is kind of very true on Rust, like it's amazing. Uh, but yeah, let's do more. So it might sound like overkill. But if you keep practicing and trying to make things better and better and better, they are going to eventually be better. So the first project was actually uh, a Grafana annotations data source API. Uh, who have ever used Grafana here? Uh, the definition is, is a dashboarding thing. It's a very, like, something oversimplifying it that shows amazing dashboards and gets Prometheus metrics and things from other sources and actually show you nice charts that helps you when you are page at 2 a.m. and try to debug something. It's great. But those charts actually don't have some context. Like, I didn't did a deploy, but I added an index to my database. And then, what is the effect of changing another part of the system? that's going to in impact my application. It's going to reduce CPU usage. The database, database queries are going to return faster. So we kind of like put a marker there, like it's a dashed line. By the way, Grafana introduced this as a native feature in Grafana 5. But there was not there yet. So we created like a, a very simple API where I just go into a, a Slack bot and say, just added an index to the database. And then we would see like a line. This is the time where the change happened. And then you could correlate what was the, the behavior of the application. And it's a very simple REST API. Like this could be like drawn in uh, 20 lines of JavaScript, whatever. So we added Prometheus metrics to this endpoint in this application, made sure that we had all the data that we, uh, a big application would have. Like how long are we taking to write to the database? How long are we, yeah, we're just doing the metrics the right way. And for things that are exceptional, that should not happen on the normal course, we have structured logs. And we're writing to the centralized logging infrastructure that we have at the company. And not only that, I made, made sure to have a CI CD pipeline so we could actually have the same practices we have for our production software, but this is on this toy project. 
Of course, after a CI CD pipeline, you're going to package it and we made sure that it worked well with Docker, make sure that we are caching the artifacts with a different set of hell when you're trying to deal with Rust because depending on how you do it, every build is going to take forever. Even if you're just doing like a hello world, you, you're bringing like several crates and suddenly your build takes 10 minutes, it's not cool. And finally, we deployed it to Kubernetes. It's kind of like, almost the standard nowadays. We still have a lot of mazes, but yeah, I think Kubernetes will. And after you do, you have done all this, after this thing is running, it's on production, you are like seeing how it works, then you need to start asking the right questions. And what is annoying to develop on Rust? Like how hard was to actually build the simple application in Rust? How do you debug this thing? Uh, it's kind of like, what are the failure modes? Like, what happens if the database dies? Is your application going to like, fault and crash? Are you going to just exit? Are you going to try to recover? So there's a lot of questions around that. Like, how to onboard new team members? Like, is learning Rust really hard? Uh, are people going to feel comfortable? Uh, how about IDE support? People, everyone loves their preferred editor. Like, and we know that there's more than Vim and Emacs, right? So essentially, everyone has their preferences. You kind of have to try to find a compromise where you can make everyone happy as possible, as happy as possible. And this was a success, mostly. The project was running, it was fine, everyone was happy, and that's it. And then we move it to the second project. Now we're going, getting more ambitious. Uh, we had an internal hackathon on the, on the company, and again, I have the opportunity of replicating the first system, the bigger one that was written in Golang, which was like, it's string processing again, reading data from Kafka, and then I found the Holy Grail. There's a very nice library called Liberty Kafka, which, which is extremely performant. You can get a lot of performance by using this thing. And I didn't have to write it. It's amazing, awesome. We use that and we start parsing a binary protocol with like some proprietary stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, but whatever. Uh, did this parsing then do some real-time analysis over this stream of data. It's kind of like it's pumping from literally like all the machines that we have and getting this data. And we got impressive performance, performance results by just trying to do the same thing that we're doing in Go, but doing using the Rust machinery. And it was a success, like a side project that went really well. We had basically zero problems, awesome. And then we go to the third project that we get like amazing, even bigger scope even more chances to fail, right? Okay, let's do a microservice in Rust, this time like with the full blown uh, structure. The idea was to fold over a Kafka stream again with a lot of machine data, process it and do like the normal operations that we needed, persist the results, so this involved ORMs, databases, and all those things. And finally, there's another, another bit that was really painful which is actually exposing it via a gRPC API, which is something that it's so easy to do in Golang, and then when you come to Rust and, oh shit, now I have to use build steps and compile the proto and generate some things to help. Yeah, okay, it went well. It was a success, right? I mean, one, two, three. The three need to be a success, please. Uh, okay, mistakes were made, a lot. <laughs> and. What happens is a combination of failures. This combination of failures starts with a very interesting problem. Uh, we suffered from the zero syndrome. And I just realized that my slides are not synchronized with the older ones. Okay. So sharks, tornadoes, diesel powered rockets, pineapple and pizza. What those things have in common? A bunch of those things happened on last RustConf, where we had Sergio showing amazing things on Rocket. And we got like, yes, we're going to use this, it's amazing. And we have seen Sim Griffin also saying like great things about Diesel and like and how zero cost abstractions are awesome and all those things. Sure. But when you add sharks and tornadoes, you get Sharknado. And you don't want that. So essentially. The, the problem is when you jump the shark, pun intended, everything gets complicated. And so when you have zero allocations, like I wanted to get the data straight from Liberty Kafka, 
and without allocating it again, I, pro I parse it in memory, I have the references going there, and then I finally use this thing and make it work, and everything is awesome, and rainbows and unicorns, and then you have like, I try to make my type zero size it, and I go diligently making this work. I push really hard my zero code abstractions. I'm going to end with zero working software because I'm wasting a lot of time. So, yes. You sum this with the fact that I was the only experienced Rust developer on this team, like noob also, but a little bit more than the other guy. Essentially, my takeaway is clone away. This might sound awkward and even counterproductive, like, wait a minute, we wanted to use Rust because of the ownership. But, you know, learning things is complicated. And if you just clone away while you're getting started, you are still going to be miles ahead on memory safety if you were doing malloc and free. It's a trade-off, it's, it's kind of like training wheels for your bicycle. You're still learning how to deal with the language. And this helps a lot for you to get speed up and get productive. And fun story, even cloning, it was faster than Go. But yeah, whatever. Learning ownership is not easy. That's my takeaway. Uh, I've been doing Rust for several years now and I still don't get it properly, I think. It's always something new that surprises me. Usually I'm wrong, that's why I get surprised. Like, oh yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't paying that much attention. But it's really rewarding. Uh, I had the pleasure of have, having an intern for this summer doing a Rust project and he was like, oh, wait a minute, I have to think before I build stuff. I, don't have, I, I just cannot like go bashing and like, think about the types, think about the things that I'm trying to do. So essentially, when you spend some time trying to learn the language better, you become a better software engineer, which is amazing. It's really cool. And talking about cool stuff and tornadoes of sharks, uh, Rust Nightly is super cool. And this was one of the main consequences of we trying to use Rocket. And this is not to Rocket's demerit. It's like, I, I still want to use Rocket. But suddenly we found out that nightly is awesome, but it's a nightmare because suddenly we had a problem that Rocket was having because of the plugins on the compiler. And then we had to upgrade to a new nightly snapshot. And then suddenly we broke Diesel and then, oh shit. And we went into that very inconsistent state where we couldn't go back because then other things will start failing in very unpredictable ways. And in hindsight, that was a very stupid idea. But yeah, it's kind of like everyone does mistakes and that's it, we're fine, it's fine. So the takeaway for this is like fewer moving parts, please, it's kind of like, if you can stick to a stable version, you're going to be a way, way happier person. Even if you miss those cool features that Nightly has. So, a high rate of change, which is actually what happens in Nightly, leads to an even higher co cognitive load. And when you think for a bit, wait a minute, we were already kind of learning and onboarding people on Rust, and the reality is that with this context, stable can be bleeding edge enough already. So yeah, Rust is cool, and it has its, its price to pay when you're learning something new. It could be any other language. And which brings me to the other points that I wanted to address today, which is the shiny object syndrome. Uh, let's be honest, uh, shiny objects are cool. It's kind of like playing with new tech, uh, new hardware, new approaches, new language like Rust, which is not that new if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, but whatever. Uh, so sometimes you get really smart abstractions. You really want to make things shine and be really efficient. And sometimes it feels like magic. Like, so I'm having this type that is being automatically dereferenced into something else. And then the compiler is able to inline this thing and make a zero cost abstraction or whatever. Like, this is amazing, but sometimes you end up with types that have like, this, where, trade, 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 several trades. It's kind of like, it gets really complex. Uh, I think that the good example is that, uh, have, 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 has anyone heard about Scala's uh, Turing complete type system where you can do like Hanoi Towers in compile time just by using types? It's kind of, 
insane and super cool. Check it out. But yeah, it's kind of like you, do, you want to play with those things and have fun. But the reality check is that this is not Hogwarts. If you're keeping doing magic, you're going to have a lot of pain to deal with this thing later. The fact that you can do it, like the Hanoi Towers, doesn't mean that you should do it on production or like on, on a real serious project. Uh, and then I have like something that is always bugging me. My background is Java programming and like very big and boring enterprise systems. And I, I ask you, oh yeah, I jumped the gun. Like, what is idiomatic code? I, I kind of like gave it away that when you are like on a Java or something more like traditional, you have a lot of literature. Like people have the, the information, like people already went through many problems and the, the, pa the patterns emerged from the need. And then you kind of like have good solutions, not only for code issues, like object orientation or whatever, or some functional paradigms that you can use, but you also have patterns for things like enterprise applications, which is going to have a talk today that talks kind of like how to structure a Rust application, which check it out. So the takeaway here is that fairies is pretty young, and it's really cute, by the way, I love this. I wish that this was like the official mascot, not the unofficial one. But the thing is, we don't have established patterns yet. We have a bunch of things that are happening, and yet, we don't have them yet, because the community is actively working on trying to find those patterns, which is great. So it's really easy to end up writing X and Y like language A and language B. Uh, and this is like a great example of the things that you should not do. It's kind of like try to make uh, abstract proxy factory effectively from Java into Go, or into, into Rust. Or you go for the if or new style of early returns and you can make like very long functions, which is pretty okay in, in Go in general. Because you're kind of like, that's the style and you get used to it and it's really like easy for you to reason about it. But this doesn't mean that it's idiomatic Rust. Also, if you end up doing a lot of match, 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 match into nested things and then you go with pyramids of doom like JavaScript. I mean, this is not JavaScript, this is Rust. We need to try to uh, play differently and actually experimenting with those things is really important, but you really need to be mindful of your own biases. We all have biases, we all have experiences in our lives. So this brings me to the most important point, which is the human factor. When we go over all this experimentation, see all the mistakes and ask the right questions again. And by the way, asking the wrong ones is fine, as long as you're asking. So the first question that I have is, am I too excited about Rust? I mean, we all love the language. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's really cool. I, I would easily like, oh, do you want to write Rust full time? Sure, why not? It's kind of, it's cool. But when we get too excited in hindsight, in hindsight it's kind of like hard for you to pay attention because you're so excited. And sometimes people are talking to you and saying like, hey, this is not cool. This is kind of like troublesome. RLS is crashing every hour. I mean, I don't, I cannot jump from a function to another. It is, I have to use C tags, really. I mean, yeah. Am I listening to what people are saying me and like the signals they are giving me? Or I just, I'm just listening to what I want to hear. Like, I love Rust and I want to make successful and YOLO, let's go. No, no. It's kind of like, we really need to be mindful. And this is an interesting one. Make sure you have explicit buy-in, not only from your direct manager, but beyond to the infinite and beyond. Why? Uh, what happens if your manager move, moves on and he was cool with a Rust project and suddenly the director wakes up and, wait, we have a Rust project here? I didn't know that. And suddenly you have a very big ball of mud to deal with. It's kind of like, it's nice to have like the, experimenting in a corner, but make sure that this is being communicated somewhere else. Coming with a surprise can be really bad and essentially can mean that even a success, successful project can be killed. So, and I think this is the most in interesting one. Like people have opinions. 
some people were like, ah, you don't need a package, ma package manager. No, no, it's fine, just vendor everything. You don't even need the Golang tools that vendor things, you just copy stuff there. I heard this, but yeah. People have opinions, surprisingly. Uh, yeah, and you need to be mindful that not everyone has to think like you and you don't have to agree with them. You have the keynote saying that we have a continuous tension between different ways of seeing things and we need to be mindful of them because at the end of the day, cargo queuing is totally a thing. Uh, and that's fair because at the end of the day, we are humans and people and interactions should matter way, way more than the technology that we are using. So on a closing note, there's a secret sauce for making all of this be a little bit easier. Uh, the secret sauce is empathy. Empathy is a powerful feature to actually make you go out of your perfect rust world and understand that sometimes Golang is the better solution. Even if it hurts to say that. But yeah, you know, we can have, we, there are some situations where it doesn't make sense to try to force things. And it, honestly, this is really hard to do. I, I would say that by far is the hardest thing, like to actually admit that, admit defeat. Okay, this is not the time yet to use Rust. But yeah, if I have to give just one advice that kind of like applies to me and I failed on this, and please don't do what I have done, please use empathy. Thank you.